Hello, so this is going to be a disclaimer before the video begins. There's a couple of things I want to clarify. The first is that I did a first video which lasted an hour 30 and then I deleted that because it was all over the place and it was going from point to point and it wasn't very coherent. So I deleted that and I did a new video which is near that time limit as well and goes through the same issues. Now, there's, it's gotten to the point where I've looked at that and I'm, I've told myself I'm probably not going to be doing a better video, so I'm just running with the second one. Now, there's a number of reasons why this video doesn't come across as the best and it isn't partic particularly articulated very well. The first is that I'm on the spectrum. I'm on the spectrum for autism and as a result, the video um, kind of illustrates that. I kind of go into full autism mode when I do this video. Like I said, I'm all around the place. I tend to be a bit incoherent and go from point to point and I tend to repeat things I've already said and there doesn't really seem to be a solution for this so I'm just going to kind of roll with it and see where it goes. When I did this video as well, I had a weird cough for some reason so I kept having to like swallow and um, at times cough uncontrollably. So I've had to do editing, but it can become very obvious at times. And it affects the video and kind of how it's portrayed. It's articulated in a certain way. And I hope people when they watch this can be understanding about it. Because I don't think certain ideas I had were articulated well enough where they could have been communicated enough essentially um so i'll let the video speak for itself but if you do watch it please be a bit considerate considerate and also understanding about it as well cheers hi so this is going to be a follow-up video from my previous video which spoke about why legion imperialis won't last long and uh, i think the feedback i got was quite interesting I think some of them were quite interesting points. I think other ones were just, uh, you know, saying stuff for the sake of it, which is interesting in itself, but it doesn't really help kind of with kind of providing feedback. Um, so this is going to kind of more go into more detailed stuff, and it's specifically going to talk about why Games Workshop sucks. And specifically, rather than talking about the obvious when it comes to these things, it's going to specifically go in depth and talk mainly about incentives and how Games Workshop as a company is incentivized to act and that they find themselves very much in a situation which they can't change drastically without having drastic changes which might affect you know people being let off and losing a large amount of money in a short amount of time. So we need to divide this discourse accordingly and we need to focus on games workshop as a company so on the higher end of the company then on the lower end of the company and then finally we need to focus on the fan base each are contributing factors as to why gw sucks as a company and it, it provides an incentive and motivates them or, or makes them act or incentivizes them to act in a particular way whereby they will have high prices they will do a lot of third-party products which have a limited lifespan so planned obsolescence and uh, it, it shows the kind of more conservative minded ways of doing marketing so we'll begin with the company itself games workshop is renowned for making miniature games and one of the things which is particularly problematic with gw as a company is the fact that they're very traditional or they're very conservative in their marketing and their release of products and they've modernized somewhat with their marketing however they they're still traditional or deep-rooted kind of they're, they, they're not very susceptible to change and they only are when it actually benefits them, obviously, as a company, which means that they're not willing to be flexible. Now, there's several issues with this, and we see this with FTSE 100 companies, whereby they don't last very long. They, long, they last, like, mainly the average is 10 to 20 years, and mainly it's because 
or one of the reasons is because conservative companies aren't susceptible to change usually startups which cost a lot of money end up getting bought out and then you know it, it might be a situation for example like um Tesla will be have Elon Musk. He will let somebody buy out the company theoretically for a high price. It gets um, populated by corporate bigwigs who are very conservative and risk averse. And that has uh, an effect on not having enough creative people. So it has a kind of culture of mer uh, mediocrity. And if you're a corporation worth your salt, you need creative people in your company but gw doesn't seem to be one of those companies which values change or initiative and that has implications because it shows that the marketing and the way that they operate product lines are very much set in the 80s and 90s now i've worked as a sales consultant as an example and and this will go kind of into the lowest part and we need to stay high but i'll use this as an example um I, I used to work as a sales consultant and one of the benefits of being a sales consultant is you get commission but also uh, apply, applying it to this example you can use your initiative in order to do that you don't get such things with uh, Games Workshop and partly working at Games Workshop is a sales job without the benefit of commission we'll go into that later but because of this you have a lot of aspects which are detrimental to advancing games workshop and it, it becomes a kind of catch-22 where there's a system in place now that's highly dependent on creating a the the system is dependent on the amount of revenue it's creating which means that games workshop isn't susceptible to change it in any way and a good example of this is uh, codex creep now back in ye olden days when the internet didn't exist you had rule books and editions and you had supplements for those which are what the codices are um but the in a world where that's no longer necessary because you can update that in real time you can sell pdfs basically which is what kings of war does with its main rule book and there doesn't seem to be any risk of it being pirated no, people are go aren't going to do that out of goodwill usually you're not going to um you're going to be able to update accordingly and you're going to be able to change rules accordingly in order to update things. Um, but with the releasing of books and on a set schedule, what you tend to get, for example, is uh, the codex that, get, that gets introduced for whatever faction tends to be overpowered and then they have to FAQ it and it re results in a lot of rule bloat. Now, this plays very much into what GW does uh, as a as a company, and because codices um, have such a significant amount of income which is made, it means that GW isn't very susceptible to changing that overall, it, and it can become very problematic. Right, one of the main complaints we we tend to get with 40k is codex creep. Um, and it also, the conservative, the conservatism of GW also is illustrated in the fact that now, rather than trying to innovate in the wargaming sector, which is originally what they were, they're trying to diversify their portfolio and make GW a brand rather than uh, something that's synonymous with wargaming. And this isn't something that uh, any, you know GW does. Any corporation who wants to play it safe and be risk averse tends to do what we call diversify their portfolio. All it means is you're put, you're investing your money in different sectors that might be unrelated to you in order to um, not have all your eggs in one basket. So if that falls down, you have like several things to depend upon. And we've seen this with Space Marine. Uh, Warhammer is now a brand name rather than being associated purely with miniature wargaming. And, um, you know, we can use a good example for this. Uh, a company that might be in digital media might sell toiletries as an exa extreme example. Because they want to put all their eggs into multiple baskets so that it, it distributes the risk and prevents it from... Uh, if there is risk in one place, they can buttress it with having their investments in other places. And we partly saw that with GW, right? They sold scented candles. Like the last thing you would expect a wargaming uh, company to produce, they produced all these weird 
products which have nothing to do with the actual franchise itself. And that's a good representation kind of why GW acts the way it does. And uh, there's a lot of similarities with GW strategy similarly to uh, video games. And we're actually seeing that with uh, the creative assembly now and what the potential risks are. Because the creative assembly um, had a lot of investment going into hyenas. That didn't work. They released Pharaoh. But because of that, they've had to fire a lot of people now and cut a lot of budget in order to sustain the massive loss that has occurred. And that can be very eye-opening for what companies like GW, who base their model on a very similar model, um, what can end up happening to them. So, we see this with um, planned obsolescence. Essentially, as Total War or the Creative Assembly with DLCs did... Um, they release newer products uh, with less content, half content, but for a higher price. And GW has been doing that as well. And the, the reason um, they've been doing that is because it seems to have worked. Otherwise, they would have been doing something different. The If you're... And it, it actually got to a point where they kicked out to 11. But because there's so many box sets being released now, um, they've had to kind of pull it back. And now what they're tending to do is invest in more long-term games that will last you know three or four or five years and then they'll drop it and go on to the next one or they'll uh, sustain it enough where it pro provides residue income um like the horus heresy and the reason why they're keeping horus heresy going is because it's making enough money for them where they can sustain it and likely that will happen to an extent with the old world as well and it would justify new model releases but essentially because there's nothing to incentivize them from doing otherwise, i.e. people are still buying these products, um, they can afford to take less miniatures out of the sets and also put um, mark up the price. And it doesn't seem like there's any real alternative in this situation. And it's simply because it's they're making money out of the situation and it's been going like that for a long time. So... Games Workshop is a um, public liability company which affects the way it's incentivized to work and it makes it actually more conservative as a result. Um, all that means is the, the company is publicly on the market, it has public shareholders who can buy shares in the company and um, it and it's one of and contrary to popular belief public liability companies which are corporations essentially are some of the most regulated entities in the world um and also it's very precarious to be a corporation this is actually contrary to popular belief of what a lot of people think corporations are corporations aren't cowboys they can't do whatever they want um and there's a lot of risk that happens to any public um liability company and also private ones to an extent as well uh, one, uh, they're very easy to be sued um, due to laws that are in place. They have certain requirements. And if um, there can be, you know, the threat of suing the public liability company if it fails too much because it owes so much to shareholders. And more importantly, um, because it's subservient in a way or not subservient, it's dependent upon its shareholders Every year it needs to justify growth. Because if you're buying shares in the company, you need to be able to see that your investments are worth the amount of money that you're putting in, which is any sort of investment. Workplace pensions are a form of ISA, basically, where you put money in, people sh uh, choose what to invest in, and you're expected to have growth as a result. Now, GW isn't a nicer, but the, the philosophy works in the same way. And it's the basis for all investment. If I put money in, in long term, I'll get um, money back. Now, this plays very much into GW's conservatism. Um, conservatism. Because it enables... Um, it, it basically means that they now have to be risk averse. And they have to stick with strategies that are going to benefit them for less gain. In other words... It de-incentivizes them to take initiative um, in order to change everything because of the fear that it will have to justify annually to its shareholders why it's not making enough money. And this is important because 
uh, shareholders are very f uh, fickle creatures. Uh, they they tend to when things aren't going well they tend to withdraw their money and go elsewhere where they're going to have safer investments and GW doesn't want to do that but it's now put them in a catch 22 cycle basically where the snake is eating its own tail where they have to justify now uh, making more and more money and to an extent they can actually do that one because nobody's saying otherwise that they can't or you know nobody's People are complaining about GW, but buying their products anyway. And secondly, um, the markup price for their products is really cheap. It, producing plastic miniatures, if you have the facilities and manufacturing, is dirt cheap. Plastic is dirt cheap to manufacture. And that has um, that basically means they can manufacture it for a very cheap price and mark up the price in order to turn a hefty profit. So this basically um, causes this get this prince these different factors guide GW's board of directors who are making these decisions in order to produce the amount, most amount of profit for the company um, in order to keep that sustainable growth in check. Now, whether that's sustainable growth is one thing is a completely different is a completely different matter entirely. And it, you know, I, I come from a historian's background and from experience of, you know, history is a massive case study. Things which are incompetent or considered unethical or exploitative can go on for very long periods of time. Um, it, uh, unless there's external factors which influence it very highly where the thing collapses like for example and this is a very generalizing example the roman empire in the west integrated with the whole roman empire lasted 600 years and it was uh, you know a very unethical corrupt place plagued by constant civil wars but it lasted that long amount of time uh, through inertia and through presence, uh, a system, an organization of people can last a very long time despite the fact things are unfair. We tend to believe that that's not the case and that sooner or later the house of cards will fall, but uh, things can last a very long time without changing much, even though there can be um, things that we consider massively inefficient, unethical, unfair, etc., um, so this is kind of the top tier level of GW. This is why GW as a whole is incentivized to work the way it works. And it's also the reason why uh, kind of bringing it back to products, they release, for example, box sets with exclusive models that won't be released either for the next two years or will only be done for a set amount of time to create artificial scarcity. Because if you're going to buy... Uh, that a box for the model you have to spend like 120 pounds and you get a lot of models you didn't want in the first place and we own we not only see it with uh, that but we see it with the game systems which are being released and we see that with revamp systems as well uh legion imperialis which is basically epic uh battlefeet gothic which isn't going to be called battlefeet gothic because um games workshop needs to put its ip and very unique names on it there's going to be a limited time span for both of these, depending on how much money they make. We saw this with Gorka Morka, which quickly folded under because not enough people were buying it. Or we, we're seeing it with um, Aeronautica Imperialis, and people have said um, that COVID kind of hindered it, but more people were buying GW during COVID than at any other point because nobody had a lot of stuff to do so it actually incentivized people to buy more 40k and age of sigma now granted they probably played most of the main games but if you're a person who's a gw fan covid doesn't seem to have deterred people from buying those box sets and this is kind of a thing that's partly to keep things going and as somebody rightly pointed out this stuff like video games are in the pipeline when uh, Creative Assembly or Sega announced hyenas. This had been several years in the pipeline. When somebody decides to come up with bringing back Warhammer Fantasy the Old World, it's been in the pipeline for several years uh, before it gets announced. And it's usually done piecemeal to kind of create a sense of excitement to do with it. However, this can also fall, make the product that's being released fall on its head. 
it's no coincidence that the planning for the old world probably coincided with the release of Total War Warhammer 3. Because essentially GW shot itself in the foot with the end times. Uh, the, the, the Warhammer Fantasy wasn't making enough money, so they decided to end, do End Times and bring out Asia Sigma. But because they had ended it, they lost a large amount of their player base who might come back uh, for the the old world. And the, the Total War Warhammer got people reinvested in the fantasy world, but they don't have anything to sell anymore. Um, and this is kind of where the marketing for that falls on its head, where they could have made a lot more money but decided not to. So even stuff like that can be inconsistent with that long-term planning. So we've gone on to uh, the high level of GW and what incentivizes it to keep the strategies that they do. In short, it's a mixture of conservatism, um, which creates a, a self-sustaining feedback loop where they have to adopt or keep conservative strategies in order to rake in the amount of money they do, for example, with codices releases or codex releases more accurately. And also because they're a public liability company, um, they have to justify the amount of dividends or profit to their shareholders. Now, public liability companies are ultimately um, dependent on two key factors, their shareholders and their... Um, customers now with the shareholders it seems that um it's exacerbated a problem where they're focusing on one and not the other um but with people buying the products anyway it seems that the that doesn't seem to have indicated that if if people weren't buying the products they wouldn't be making enough money and that would have a knock-on effect on the shareholders uh, seeing that there's not any profit driven and an annual meeting um, for a public liability company for its shareholders is the lifeline and uh, li companies get around this in certain ways um, there's a fame there's a kind of an anecdote where accountants can make accounts look the way you want them to look so they might word things in a certain way the balance sheet can often be very convoluted and geared to make things look as though things are going well when they're they're not um but the share price can also indicate whether something's going well or not so now we go on to the middle level or the low level of gw on the average store and there's several reasons why gw sucks in this case and i'll use the example as a i used to be a sales consulting working part-time and the benefit of being a sales consultant is you can make commission. You can make a hefty commission. And I remember one day I got, I was working part time, but I got a solid grinding commission for selling. So you can make a, a hefty profit, even though, you know, you're being paid minimum wage, which isn't a lot of money. For the average person who works as a person in GW, unless they're in HR or payroll, they're going to be a salesman. And they're incentivized specifically to sell the products GW wants them to sell, which destroys any initiative and creates this kind of uh, environment of mediocrity. Um, because managers work on the incentives that they're provided, right? And we can use an economic example for this. Uh, General Mexidas of Greece um, wanted to reduce the amount of chickens in Greece. So he, there was a famous story where he paid everyone a drachma for every chicken head that uh, they received. Well, all that did is incentivize more people to produce more chickens because it means more drachmas, more money for the thing. So your policies can often have unintended effects. And we can see this, for example, in the property market. If you, lower, if you um, change interest rates through some uh, unrelated or very complicated affairs, it affects the house prices. And, you know, um, organizations and groups of bodies of people are like organisms. If you if you mess with one part of the organism, it often has an un unintended effect. And incentives work in a, in a very similar way. So you have this person who is doing a sales job, who doesn't have the benefit of commission, but... More importantly, they're being incentivized to make money selling something that um, G head, head HQ, head office wants them to sell, like Dark Vengeance starter boxes. 
And that often means that managers, and I don't know if they do it now, they certainly used to do it, have to pounce on you in order to sell you this specific thing. Not only that, if you're making good money um, and it, you're bringing the store from red into the green, um, they'll often bring inspectors into the store. And inspectors in a lot of cases are very unfair when it comes to this stuff. If you're not talking to customers the way they want you to talk to customers, you'll get a bollocking from HQ. Even though the whole day you could have been talking to customers and making sure that they're given the right products and making sure that they're um, being given the right service and making a lot of money. You can make £100 in five minutes, it doesn't matter because you didn't talk to that one customer in the store. So it's very unfair on um, on uh, the managers who run the stores themselves. And it often means that they have to work within the system in order to try and um, not draw attention from head office. Now, this is also coinciding with the way that they sell to people. And I worked for GW very briefly towards the end times and I quit for a number of reasons. I just didn't really like working there. But they have a 12-step program in which to build rapport with people to focus on the hobby itself which is why GW managers are always very keen to steer you back into the hobby. And the, the reason they do that is because there's a book that they have to learn and read about to steer them in. Now, as a sales consultant, it's absolute bullshit, basically. But it often means managers are very um, robotic and they don't necessarily know how to interact with people. And it's also a representation of kind of the more mediocratic element in it and drawing from the mediocratic we can go on to the next part which is middle managers essentially um middle managers in gw are some of the worst middle managers that exist and that's talking about retail and retail is has a reputation when it comes to managers that a lot of them are lousy and don't know what they're doing and um, are usually unfair to low-paid workers and gw is no different and we see that with people who are underneath middle managers at stores. And I've heard constant horror stories about being treated unfairly. And the reason is quite simple. Um, it's almost like the middle managers at GW are now a kind of carryover from the 80s and 90s. And they're their own self-sustaining ecosystem. And it's very difficult to get rid of these people because job security is so high in the UK, which means that these people can often um, run stores the way they want them to in line with what HQ wants. And GW knows this is the case. They know that um, stores could be selling a lot better and not be in the red. And they know that these managers are assholes, basically. But they kind of tip their hat to these people and... Um, basically incentivize them to keep that behavior going uh, regardless of what's going on um, and this is partly segueing into another issue which is the downsizing of GW stores once upon a time and I remember this and you probably remember this if you're watching this GW used to have bigger stores with gaming tables where you could go out and hang out um, and you know play games they downsized it and they created small tables where you could gather around because they wanted GW stores to be a um, storefront where they could sell miniatures. So you had these communities who had um, existed f from the 2000s, 80s and 90s and had been broken up essentially and now are going to like third party uh, retailers. And that's detrimental to the store itself because it means that um, the, the GW doesn't seem to understand that the life and blood of the hobby are the hobbyists themselves in the community, which means that the, um, there's no games coming in and because there's no games coming in, there aren't people who are incentivized or encouraged to play more. And now the, um, this can kind of vary. There are some managers who let gaming tournaments and campaigns happen in store, but they have to do it on the down low without telling head office. And because of that, um, it really brings into perspective kind of the loss of money that could potentially be there. And it's simply because 
GW is very reliant on footfall in order to sustain the the profits and the money. So they will the the dependent on people coming into the stores or buying the products and the amount of money that they make from third party retailers is pretty hefty anyway. Which is why some they in from my perspective they can offset not getting a lot of sales in the store itself. So it becomes an increasing situation where communities that had exist die out and are no longer going to the store. This is also coinciding with an, an earlier point as well, or it's not actually, it's kind of a cutaway, that managers uh, with this mediocrity are kind of caught in a catch-22 between being under a lousy middle manager, um, having to sell a specific product, and knowing that they can't take initiative in order to bring the store's profits up to green. Um, and that screws them a lot in the way. And the turnover for managers in GW are at, is actually quite high. So on a lower level, it puts a lot of pressure on managers that otherwise would able, be able to do a better job, coinciding with the fact that there's not a lot of footfall going into the store, um, which affects their bottom line. And so we'll move on to the next part of the... Uh, video which is essentially the GW community or the Warhammer community as well. Now a lot of this is what I've heard from other people and is measured from experience and also my experiences as well and essentially there's a, there's a lot of stereotypes and negative connotations to do with people who play GW products and they're not unfounded actually. Um, I think the it, the truth is stranger than fiction and actually all these things are relatively true. So let's go through all the negative stereotypes of the average person who plays Warhammer. Uh, lack of hygiene, that's not only a Warhammer issue, that's an issue in Magic the Gathering as well. And all these issues are in activities like Magic the Gathering, they attract similar people. Uh, Anti-social, not necessarily, you know, going around and breaking windows, but... Uh, not really interacting with other people, very elitist and snooty behavior, very spoiled, though not kind of the previous generation, certainly this generation. And um, because of that, there's no sense of any sort of repercussions for these people's actions. And it's also the reason why we have um, the system that GW promotes will incentivize certain behavior like cheating or a really bad behavior overall when it comes to gaming um and it's partly to do as well with the fact that gw's gaming system isn't built to be competitive original gw games required a gm which was a leftover from uh, the D, D days where you would have a game of 40k or road trader and you would have somebody mediating between both people which is often why these rule bloats and these large amounts of rules often mean there's very le borderline legalistic disputes between both people and it's very difficult to keep track of those but we need to understand why this community is the way it is and i think it's the fact that gw's products are now geared towards or are now being bought a lot by upper middle class people rather than middle class people or working class people and that has effects on everything that they do because usually people who start off are starting off relatively young they have uh, parents who are high earning parents so what you know mum's a lawyer and dad's a doctor and they often don't, as a result, have time to spend with their children, which means they can't rear them properly, which is an increasing problem with upper middle class children, um, which creates an infantileness and spoiltness with children as a result. Um, but essentially, these people, either through their jobs or the way they're raised and the mum and dad spends money on them, it means that they can afford to buy a lot of GW in a certain amount of time. And it also uh, explains the reason why there's power gamers. Because you can be that type of person who can go into a store and put £300 down and buy a Leagues of Votan box. because, Or a, a whole force in one month because, or one purchase because Leagues of Votan are in vogue when it comes to the tournament scene. This creates a lot of implications. And one of those is... If you are raised, essentially being given what you want and with no repercussions whatsoever, and, you know, you're, 
it's harder for somebody who who comes from a working class family who doesn't have a lot of money um for a parent to to be able to afford to buy stuff and it's easier for a parent to turn to a kid and say we can't buy this because i simply can't afford it compared to um a parent who can but uh who has to now justify a reason for their child not being able to buy Warhammer, even though they have the money and they live in a nice house and they have two cars or whatever. And also some parents can be very doting to their children, which isn't very helpful a lot. So to psychologically understand this, we have to understand if you're raised in a more well-off environment and you're given whatever you essentially want, the boundaries between understanding what's acceptable and what's not acceptable becomes blurred. And in fact, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish, which means that children who are very much spoiled um, are often not punished enough. And when I say punished, I don't mean hard punishment. They're not given a firm barrier or boundary between what's acceptable behavior and what's not. And that's partly due to lack of adversity. And it's partly because loving parents want to give their child the best opportunities. So they buy them the stuff that they want. Right. Um, and we, we actually have a case like this. There's a rat utopia experiment. So this took part either in the seventies, I think. And it, was basically um, an environment for rats. There was this large uh, amount of space and there was an infinite amount of resources. And what they found is that the rat community in that colony would peak population-wise and then it would plummet. And the simple reason is, is that uh, abundance of goods essentially uh, destroyed any social boundary between the rats. And there's quite a lot of horror stories. So... Uh, male rats would go in and basically assault the female rats because there were no social boundaries that existed and they couldn't distinguish between acceptable and non-acceptable behavior and the mother rats would um, also injure their children because they didn't know how to raise them in in short it's a lot more complicated than that but that's kind of a simplistic interpretation and it, the, the simple reason is is because rats thrive in situations of borderline scarcity and adversity and humans firstly are more smarter than that so and more intelligent um but it's important to emphasize our dna count in relation to rats is very similar so even though we won't follow the same path there are some similarities and one of those similarities is if there isn't any adversity and there's an abundance of things Often social boundaries can disappear entirely with a lack of understanding between what's acceptable and not acceptable behavior. And we see that as we can use that as a case study um, for GW. And essentially, you have people who become salary men for GW from a young age um, who don't work for the company, but all their focus is, is GW. And it's something that they do every single day. And they don't do anything else um, or they play other very nerdy hobbies. And, you know, that's and there's nothing to incentivize them to do anything otherwise. And you get situations where people turn 30 and they go, what the hell am I doing with my life? I've spent the past 15 years of my life just playing GW like I didn't do anything else. I didn't go out. So there's lack of. There's no incentive for the person to experience growth or expand their horizon to learn something new, to meet new people, um, to be able to um, grow and develop as a person, which I already said grow. Um, but essentially, th this is the reason why you find that there are some people in GW who play Warhammer, who are very elitist, very snooty, um, who are cheaters who uh, are very um, excluding to newcomers and it's simply because those people are often not incentivized to work in any other environment and experience any sort of adversity where that's the case now it's not only those types of reasons um, the, the other reason is uh, GW is something you work with your hands a lot and it's more of a thing rather than a care thing and that's why a lot of men, despite the fact it's also kind of very high fantasy militaristic, which men tend to be more attracted to that sort of thing. Um, it, it invites people not having to be very social in the um, 
activity. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because if you're on the spectrum or you're autistic, um, you know, GW tends to attract a lot of people who are neurodivergent. However, that being said, from experience, um, there are a lot of people who are neurodivergent in the hobby who have parents who try their best to care for them, um, but the the guidance on teaching their autistic children social norms explicitly isn't very apparent. And I don't think it's actually the parents' fault. I think a lot of parents try, but at the same time... Um, you know, from my experience, and I am somebody who's on the spectrum, um, there is a lot to be desired in that particular context. And you see this a lot with parents who have children who are autistic or have children with Down syndrome. They tend to spoil them a lot and try to um, mollycoddle them and barricade them from the realities of life. All you ha All that happens is you get the same effect that you get when you... Um, mollycoddle neurotypical people you get you get people who are somewhat spoiled but with the added benefit or added detriment that they don't understand social cues um and we know this because there are a lot of autistic people who play 40k who are very social because they were um reared or not reared reared is not the right word they were brought up in a way that was um beneficial to themselves as well and it's a lot of hard work and this is also the reason as well is if you're if your mum's a lawyer and she's working stupid hours and your dad's a doctor and he's working stupid hours as well they don't have enough time to sit down with their children and teach them uh the thing is that more more available time for parents would give them the opportunity to do right um you have very busy parents who are earning a lot of money and it has a det it's detrimental to the kid as well who might at times often be left alone with their computer to do whatever they want to do and you know money is used as a supplement for that when really care and consideration should be doing that so that's why you kind of get this community of very insular people who can be very obnoxious who don't necessarily understand social boundaries uh, because nobody it can also be the case that nobody's taken the time to give the consideration to teach those social boundaries and uh, the, you get an elite community who's very snooty and very elitist when it comes to new players and i've seen that happen and i've heard that happen um more i've heard it let's be very honest uh, when it comes to newcomers in the community and it also comes to people who are just very rude and um, very forthright with their rudeness. And it's also partly to do because a lot of people who are the old, old guard of 40k got bullied as children. And they got bullied as children by people who grew up and got into the hobby as adults who very much look like the people who bullied them. So as a kind of lashing out psychologically, they will lash out at these people um, and... Um, give them a negative time because it's now their opportunity to lash out at the people who they thought reminds them of the people who bullied them as well um, and you know if you're going to have a situation like that it's probably best you see a therapist or have a, somebody deal with it rather than doing that but remember uh, 40k can be antisocial not in a in a violent sense but it can be asocial so it doesn't require a lot of interacting and it can also be an insular community of as i've mentioned and a lot of things happen in the community that's not appreciated that doesn't seem to happen in any other communities uh historical war gamers coming from a historical background does happen to an extent because you get anal people who are telling you that napoleon's old guard uh, coat scheme that you did wasn't the correct um, shade of blue to an extent now where you get you know Saga who does historical war games who more or less is like it's not that important that you get the paint job right um, but a as a historian you know it really doesn't matter it's a game don't worry about it but you get this more in 40k and to an extent other games as well um, and it's not appreciated, you know, having somebody play Grey Knights and having somebody, you know, call call them Gay Knights or something um, isn't appreciated. It's hilarious when you think about it when it's off the top of the tongue, but um, it 
you know, some people hear that constantly again and again and again. And this lack of social boundaries and, you know, not being autistic, but being almost autistic with not understanding social cues um, is detrimental for people who are joining the hobby. I'm And I'm not arguing this from a male or female perspective. Um, I'm asking people to understand this from an empathetic perspective. If you're a woman getting into the hobby and you want to get a recommendation for what type of um, faction you play, you want someone basically to tell you, well, you know, rule of call, you should go for whatever you're interested in. But if you're looking for this play style, you want to choose this faction. And if you don't, but you want more numbers, you want to choose this faction. And it's really the way you want to do it. And just as a heads up, it's a bit of a money sink. We, I want to warn you that in advance. But if you um, kind of try to follow my advice, we can mitigate that as much as possible. And I can show you very good places where you can buy paints and they're not expensive and brushes and etc. But instead, you get people who instinctively as a knee-jerk reaction will say, um, you know have some guy lecture to them that they should play Sisters of Battle or lecture to them that um, female space marines don't exist. And, you know, fiction is one thing. There's a time and a place for discussing um, law. And I agree with that. You know, it's based in the law and, you know, trying to change that to suit uh, sensibilities because of modern political connotations, I don't think works. Um, but you need to imagine yourself from the perspective of somebody who's coming in the game to hear stuff like this. And basically, it, it scares them away from the game. I would probably do the same as well. Um, because it, it's it's somewhat intimidating and it's nerve-wracking enough getting into something new. And um, it's also detrimental for GW as well because GW wants to be inclusive. Not in the uh, inclusive as in the modern political context, but they want as many people to come into the hobby as possible um so it affects people on a ground level to do the community itself and the way that gw writes markets its goods and also uh, releases its products and the way it determines its rule set will incentivize that type of behavior but also some of this can't really be helped um Model miniature wargaming, because it's wargaming and it's militaristic, and also you're working with your hands a lot, and it's not that women don't work with their hands a lot, but things which are thing-orientated tend to attract men a lot compared uh, to women. Now, there are outliers to this. For example, there are a lot of men who go into care, for example. They, they go into care professions, they become nurses, whether there's specific em or child care where there's specific emphasis on looking after other people but those tend to be more in a minority and they tend to come with a lot of baggage to do with discriminatory behavior towards them and having worked in a primary school myself i understand that entirely um you know especially in somewhere like reception or nursery where it's perceived that women should really be uh, in that level of affairs um and that's just kind of the way reality works, right? But we're seeing this in Scandinavia where um, people who um, have all the opportunities because social boundaries have been completely removed tend to go to what is traditionally male or female with outliers um, going to those. So that's also partly the reason. And that comes with its own baggage as well as a result. Not in a discriminatory sort of way, but in the same way that martial arts for example is predominantly a male activity and there are few females um it's just kind of a numbers game at that point and so with all of this in mind and what gw is like how do we change this how do we mitigate this um and i think it boils down to two key factors one competition and two um, ab abstaining or absconding um, so the first one is uh, going to competitors in terms of retail who can offer better products and better care um, and being able to um, offer more bang for your buck um, and being incentivized uh, to do that will mean that you'll be having a better experience overall and the second one is just not buying GW products and, you know, people who have a lot of money who have bought several armies can afford to do that as well. 
Um, there were two factors I didn't mention and I'll bring them up now. And the first is that um, planned obsolescence can also be detrimental for the fan base. Um, for example, with Primaris Marines, and we're seeing that with Warhammer Fantasy The Old World, there's bigger bases, which is more convenient for rank and flank miniatures, but it also means that you have to rebase all of your miniatures. And if you're somebody who collected Warhammer Fantasy who now has to rebase all of them for Age of Sigma, you're not going to do that. And you can go to Mantic, you can go to uh, One Page Rules, you can go to other rank and flank games where you don't have to do that. But also one thing I did want to talk about, which I forgot, I've just remembered now, is uh, the way GW treats its employees. And uh, you need to understand it like this. GW expects when people join to be passionate about GW, to love the product itself. And, those, and they're always um, looking for people who are very passionate, who are willing to move to go to a new store, who are willing to work through thick and thin and through hell in order to uh, run a GW store. But that often means that there's things that middle managers will do to take advantage of that and what the store will do, or the, sorry, the company more accurately. So a good example that I've heard is training days. You will be told that you need to come into the store on a Saturday where you're not getting paid and you have to attend for training, even though it's complete bullshit and people can legally not do that. But if you don't know any better, you're going to do that. The rate of pay is terrible. And I'm surprised more people sign up for roles like this um, and jobs at GW, unless you're, you know, somebody in bookkeeping or HR where you might be paid more or you're an executive bigwig. Uh, um, if you're earning 17000 working in Games Workshop a year in a retail job, that should probably tell you it's not a good job. And if you're a manager, like even a top-end manager, you're earning about 25000 which is despicable. And especially if you're in London, none of those are sustainable in any meaningful way um, because things are too expensive. Um, so, And even outside of London, like seventeen grand is isn't um, sustainable in any way with the price cost of living. So there's also this amount of abuse where and partly an exploitation as well, where GW can essentially not pay their workers enough and will make excuses that, oh, we gave our workers like two bonuses this year. And they usually do it in one go, from my understanding. And it's really not that much. Um, they could afford to pay their workers more and they decide not to. And. Um, they use the love of the game and Games Workshop to entice you to work for them. But they're very, uh, there are a lot of red flags from their perspective. If you try to talk about pay, that's a giant red flag. If you try to talk about being treated a certain way, that's a massive red flag at GW. They want you to be a specific type of person. In the same way that Disney treats its employees. And it's no coincidence as well that... The same type of people who play 40k can in a lot of cases be the same type of people who are like uh, Disney fans, who are grown adults and go to Disney, which is designed primarily for families and kids, which is very uncomfortable for me because of the intent. Um, now, you can you can spend money doing whatever you want and do whatever you want, obviously, but if you're spending money to participate in something that's designed for kids and families and you're an adult with none of those factors in mind, you know, you got to, I think it would be very uncomfortable for me to do that. But so, as I said, there's two solutions to this problem. The first one is competition, going elsewhere and playing other games. And the second one is absconding and not buying GW products. And we need to understand this from the perspective of the CEO. From the, from the perspective of the CEO or executives, the thing that they only have as a point of reference and bearing in mind that CEOs go to financial advisors on a daily basis or people who can inform them on what decisions they can do to guide the company in a certain way and they take full liability if the company suffers. The only point of reference they have, and this represents the disconnectedness between the high place and the low place, and it also represents a position of middle managers as well because middle managers are often... Uh, people who are a bridge between upper management and uh, the workers, which often means that they're more messengers than innovators, which often means that they can't actually change anything 
or do anything, which is why most middle managers at GW are unbearable uh, and absolutely horrendous. You have middle managers who are designed to go in stores and tank the company so they can bring in new managers to bring it back up in the way that GW wants them. G GW knows how to hire people based on facts like this. Um, but if you're an upper middle manager or whatever, if you're an executive, your only point of reference due to the disconnection with the lower part is seeing the numbers and seeing what the bottom line is. And that's really, with that and the share price, that's the only thing that uh, people like executives can use as a point of reference. And um, it often means that they'll only investigate things if um the the bottom line has been cut out and it's often the case like with the creative assembly you can have marketing managers who have been doing you know very bad practices for so long who finally get fired and let off because they're costing a lot of money and they're costing you know creative assembly their bottom line that's the only point of reference they have so the, the way you have to tackle that is by affecting that uh, bottom line and that uh, profit margin and the amount of growth that's being done. Now, the way you do that is through uh, reasonable discourse, so not getting emotional, and through action. And also through memes and mocking, right? Uh, which is what the Total War community did, and it had a detrimental effect um, because... People weren't buying the products and at the same time they were illustrating the point reasonably through tongue-in-cheek humor as well that they um, weren't going to give in to what CA was offering as a product because they saw it as subpar. And, you know, the expression goes, the market speaks for itself. Um, we shouldn't really even call it a market. It's a place of wants, needs and desires. So the term market is a bit misleading, but people... And this is reflective of GW. GW will only do what works because it's what people are willing to buy indicates that what they're doing works. If I was making money for a certain way for 20 years with, with growth every year, it, it doesn't incentivize me to change my behavior because if, if I don't have to change my behavior and I'll make more money, why would I change my behavior, right? So... Being able to have that sense of action and being able to go elsewhere and not buy GW products, which may happen if the products become too expensive, will incentivize people to be like, look, I'm just not going to buy stuff anymore from it. It's just too much of a money sink. Um, if I have to convert, I have to buy two tanks and it's going to equal like £100. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and even like upper middle class people will begin to question why they're spending so much on plastic miniatures now i don't think it's going to happen and the reason is is because there's a self-perpetuating cycle of people complaining about gw products but buying the products afterwards uh warhammer fans are some of the most fickle fans there are and there's not a lot of strong headedness because they'll complain and bitch and whine about stuff and not buy the and then go and buy the products but you need to not do that. And um, if you don't do that, then all it's going to indicate to GW is everything's going well and dandy. And they can just keep doing what they want to do. Organizations, corporations, charities, groups of people will do whatever they want to do unless there's sufficient resistance to suggest otherwise. Most people will do things like this, organizations, groups of people, because they can. And usually if there's barriers in place from other people who are causing these um, obstructions, they'll just carry on regardless. It's really a case of having a, a firm amount of determination in order to do it. But when people are headstrong and decide to make this decision, they can't backtrack on it. If you're trying to de-incentivize somebody from acting the way they are so you have a disobedient child or you have somebody who's antisocial. you can't just um, punish them and then be doting on them afterwards because then you're telling them that um, their behavior is justified and it encourages them more to act in the same way in the same way if you 
are going to abscond from GW. You can't just, you know, a month later go and start buying GW products again. Even though you said you weren't going to. Um, because all you're doing is sending a message that the, this type of behavior is okay. And I know what GW is going to do in relation to this. If they lose money, they're either going to tell people tough love and try to, um, you know, uh, man up and soak it all up. Or they're going to try and incentivize people to um, come back to the, to the hobby with uh, different products and also trying to do it without having to lower the price at any cost because the last thing gw ever wants to do is lower the price um but you need to keep at it and you need to keep steadfast and i'll use a philosophy to kind of help in this scenario words in a lot of ways are an illusion um they're an illusion in the sense not in the fact that they're not real um but that they're used to indicate very complex things very simply um and without words we wouldn't be where we are today but one thing i learned as a young man so in my 20s is that um the majority of human interaction is non-verbal like 95 percent of human interaction is non-verbal it's all body language and actions so what I did, and this is an interesting experiment if you've never thought about this before, is I started watching groups of people the same way I started watching nature documentaries. Because the majority of nature documentaries are non-verbal, right? You're watching what's going on and the only person telling you something is a narrator like David Attenborough or something. So um, I, I started doing this and what I found is it informed me a lot of the way human behavior works and it tends to work based mostly on action and implicit social norms and what you tend to find is and every group has this is there's usually one person who's often the most social who has a certain aura of charisma about them so in working class environments it can be Jack the Lad like you know, in Only Fools and Horses, Derek Trotter's a Jack the Lad type of guy. In middle class communities, it can kind of be gym goers, people who lift a lot. And even in uh, upper class communities, that can be the case as well. Uh, the socialite, the, the 1920s flapper who's head of parties, the great Gatsby, that type of person. Um, and then, you know this this is this goes beyond demographics or specific groups of people in both um different ethnic groups and also different uh groups to do with sex so men and women this happens regardless and it also happens as a, as a way of kind of mediating group change as well within that group not in a machiavellian way so it doesn't need to be a case of manipulation but it, it can be um, Machiavellian as well especially when you get antisocial uh, people especially women because women tend to be more socializers than men um, but you tend to see that there and something that I've concluded is that words don't really matter as much as people make them out to be and I'll use an example to show this point you've probably had someone that you've known who has been who couldn't physically at any way manipulate you but manipulated you to do something you otherwise wouldn't have done or made you believe something you otherwise wouldn't have believed and we see this with abusive partners right so um a partner will cheat with somebody else and um they'll gaslight their partner into thinking it wasn't a big deal they'll manipulate their partner and abuse them uh, emotionally and psychologically and often destroy lives and these people can oftentimes not recover from what's happened and um, at no point did they do anything physical at no point did they do anything um, that would have restricted the person from acting in a different way and that's the point um, all this stuff is illusionary in the way it works so let's use a case example Let's say I want to get into a new hobby and I tell my friend and my friend points his finger at me and says to me, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that at all. Um, you're not going to get into that new hobby out of nowhere, very aggressively, but he's smaller than you and he can't really overpower you. 
but you care about his opinion. And if you're a very agreeable person, you might just not end up doing the hobby. But even though somebody's ordered you not to do something and somebody's told you that it's impossible or you can't do it or there's no meaningful way you can do it. If I end up doing it in the end anyway, it 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 completely cancels out what they did and it shows that they have no power over me. Um, but in that similar in a similar way to that, um people who market and organizations work on a similar basis they make the suggestion of what you can and can't do so powerful that you think there's no alternative to do it and you actually see this with modern media when it comes to political discussions often you know everyone has a bias but they will push a certain uh environment and setting as part of marketing which borders propaganda basically um to make you believe a certain state of affairs is occurring. And marketing works the same way as well, right? The idea of carbs being essential to diet. It is essential to diet, but being based on the main thing and having the food pyramid was based on, um, you know, uh, people who were lobbyists in the USA who were farmers and were getting subsidized by the government and they want to keep those subsidies to make a surplus of food so they have these very powerful lobbying groups who can influence the government and then you can have things which is often objective based be perverted in order to suit a certain political agenda and this is why the marketing on this stuff is so powerful because they want to incentivize you to work in a certain way and gw is no different so um it's really it's really dependent on whether or not people will listen and will um, change their behavior to do it. But if Warhammer's been your entire life, then you're less likely to want to change your behavior. But do it, because it will make you grow as a person, and it will make you have other experiences, and it will make you become a complete person. Adversity creates character. Like pressure creates diamonds. Um, the idea that you can change and be a different person in time to what eventually you were before um, shows that you can develop as a person and become a better person and change through time to be that person. And, you know, maybe it's a signal that you indeed have been playing 40k for too long and need to do other stuff as well. Um, and this is what we usually get. Uh, people who did it at an early age stop completely and then they go back into the hobby at an older age because it's something that brought nostalgia and they missed it but the benefit of those people is they're they're dissected and they're detracted so much from the activity that they have a sense of objective perspective um so you know there isn't a happy ending to this because things can just go on as much as they want to without any sort of benefit um, but it depends on the behavior of people and how they deal with this. And it would require a lot of organized um, organized collective behavior in a certain way in order to affect this type of change. So I hope this has been somewhat um, informative. I hope this has been somewhat uh, giving some perspective into GW and why it sucks as a company. And showing that, you know, things can be complicated, but at the same time, there might be ways to remedy these sorts of situations. And if people want a good example of where things can go right, um, the German company Aldi and Lidl. So for people who don't know what these are, uh, Aldi and Lidl are German supermarket chains. Um, and what's particularly uh, interesting about them is they don't have shareholders. And they often have waiver thin profit margins because the majority of their profit goes back into the company itself. And it often means that they can produce cheaper products. So it often means that they're more competitive than other supermarkets. Um, and they, in the UK, they used to be seen as uh, kind of low down goods to buy. So people used to look down upon them. But when the recession hit, they grew in popularity because uh, they were more cheaper products and they were certainly uh cheaper than other 
uh, supermarkets like Waitrose, Tesco's or Sainsbury's. So if you want a company that's a good example of how you can mitigate this with competition, that's a very good example. So in a certain way, there can be a war gaming company who comes around that actually does a better job. But again, it's 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 a 50-50 on whether or not it will be good or bad. Uh, there will be a good or bad outcome. And I'll finally leave it on this note. If you want to assess whether or not something's good or something's bad, if you can't assess the intent, assess the outcome. So there's outcomes and there's intent. And this is a deontological perspective, which is, uh, as a matter of principle, things are right and wrong. And then there's a utilitarian perspective, which is the ends justify the means. And they can both be taken to a horrible conclusion. So, for example, um, if I want to kill one person to save five people that's a utilitarian argument but there's a question of whether that one person's life was worth killing to save five people a deontological perspective or an intent perspective is um murder is wrong in all situations and there's something that Immanuel Kant talks about when he talks about uh deontological principles let's say there's an island that's flooding and somebody's being condemned to death. Immanuel Kant, as a deontologist, would argue that person would need to be executed before everybody heads out and evacuates the island. Then you can get into very cloudy ethical grounds with very deontological principles about right and wrong. Murder is wrong in all circumstances. But if you look at any legal case, uh, you can see that... Um, and law isn't exactly ethical, though it needs to be to an extent to guarantee public interest. However, if you look at a legal case uh, concerning murder, often um, you will see that the cases will be done more on a case-by-case -case basis and um, will become very refined and very specific on that case-by-case -case basis. Um, so some acts are seen as more justifiable than another. If somebody's trying to kill you, and you end up killing them in the process of self-defense, you can you might be acquitted on self-defense grounds. Uh, however, if you kill somebody unreasonably, um, you might be sent you're likely going to be sent to prison for that. So even situations of uh, intent to kill can be non-absolute. And this is the problem, right? And the the point is is that both of these are dependent or contingent upon each other, intent and outcome. And um, you can often gauge the well-being of somebody or an organization by their intent or outcome. If GW produces good products, but it treats its employees like garbage and price gouges people, it's probably an indication that its outcome isn't very good. Um, if there's a fruit as part of the tree and the fruit is rotten... It, it indicates that the tree is rotten as well. If there's crops and the crops are subpar, it indicates that the soil and the field are subpar as well. And this stuff is important, right? Because um, something that I've learned in my... Uh, I'm in my 30s now, so in my years of being here, and it hasn't been a very long time for me um, in the time span of human history, is that... You want to spend your time as efficient and as economical as possible. And that means living the type of life you want to live and living the type of life that's going to benefit you within reason. So it's also not um, hurting other people, but it benefits you as well. Um, and that means, you know, being able to know what your priorities are. Because if you spend 15 years of your life glued to GW and not doing other things... Um, you don't have the opportunity to really assess in a broader perspective how good your life could possibly be in retrospect and what you could be reading or doing or what activities you could be doing. And that that goes for who you associate with and also what you vi highly value. Because if you learn one thing, and Marcus Aurelius says this in his meditations, things are often fleeting and temporary anyway. And that goes for the way you attach yourself to things and it's and i'm not a religious person but we can use a religious example to justify this point in the bible um they there's a constant amount of talk of sacrificing stuff 
Abraham has to sacrifice his son Isaac. Um, and people misunderstand that story, I think. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding that story. But the, the, the whole point of the theme of sacrifice in that story is imagine you have something that's so valuable, so intrinsically worth so much to you, and then you're asked to give it up. Um, that can destroy people's perspectives, right? If you lo- and, and that's the point. There are people who intrinsically love somebody who have a... Who have it, uh, that person has a lot of intrinsic value to them, but they abuse them. The the person being loved gets abused by the people that they have an intri- that the person has an intrinsic value to them. And the best way that you deal with that is you sacrifice the thing you love the most, and that includes you know products you love the most. That includes people as well. If you want to deal with abusive people, the best thing to do is to let them go and sacrifice them to life. That's what you mean by sacrificing something. You let it go. And um, sometimes that means never talking to that person ever again and escaping from that abuse and and that environment. Now, that's a very extreme example, but it, it has a lot of key connotations with GW products as well. How much are you willing to sacrifice to grow as a person and how much are you willing to sacrifice to get um, what you want to be a better person as well? How much How much uh, talk and how much game do you really have? How much are you willing to say, well, I don't agree with GW as a, as a person because they treat their employees lousy or their stuff is too expensive? And then not going out and buying their products. There are a lot of fickle people in GW and um, they they often rant and they shake their fists, but they often do nothing about it. And I'm sick and tired of looking at those people and hearing what they have to say because it falls on um, deaf ears and all GW does is just mockingly laughs at them and just releases new stuff anyway. Um, And this is the thing, when people actually enact change and they see there's actual change taking place, they can often be in disbelief and want to return back to the status quo. Um, We've come on to a weird philosophical tangent, but maybe that answer to sacrifice will be an incentive enough for people to actually, if they don't like GW and realize that the company sucks, take measurable steps in order to enact change that's better for them which will lead to beneficial changes overall when it comes to releasing products to James Workshop, Games Workshop. And maybe prices will be cheaper. I don't know if they necessarily will. I think that's a death wish for GW, but um, maybe it will enact something that will make GW have to take drastic steps. And like the Creative Assembly, that means they might have to let off a number of people, a large amount of people, and incur a short-term large amount of loss in order to change and take initiative. And that's incentive for GW to actually stay conservative. So there isn't an easy answer, and it's really something that people will have to try and decide. But again, I would say the solution would be to either go to competition or just not to buy their products. Um, But if you are going to do it, don't deal in hyperbole, don't deal in sensationalist thinking, don't deal in exaggerations. Be reasonable, be coherent, um, be rational when you deal with this stuff and try to... um, you know, be reasonably mocking as well as abstaining as well um, by by making light of the situation that GW wants you not to act like. GW wants you to be emotional. They want you to um, act out and lash out because by doing that, you can't think rationally. Um, they don't want people who can be rational thinkers when it comes to this and coherent. They want people who... Um, can be emotional and um, can be only subject to their emotions because it means that they can't make um, delayed decisions. They can't sacrifice. They can't delay gratification for greater gain. And this is what all corporations do that they have to sell something. They'd rather you be emotional and buy a hundred pounds worth of products rather than 
uh, waiting a month and seeing if there's a better deal and spending 20 pounds and that's delayed gratification if i ask you to wait a week you can have 10 pounds now or 20 pounds in a week and 20 pounds might not be a lot today when i was being raised it meant a lot um but the second option is always best and it's a good assessment of a person's character on what decisions they try to make maybe that's telling about the community as well um so i hope you've enjoyed this video i hope you've found this informative and thank you very much